So now today we're going to be talking about the second factor that affects reaction rate, which is the effect of temperature. And we have an equation to govern that, which is the Arrhenius equation, where it's K, which is the rate constant, equals A times E to negative EA over RT. And I'll, Tariq, to answer your question, yes, the only thing, the only thing is homework next week, yep. Uh, so T is your temperature in Kelvin. We're always going to use Kelvin. R is your rate constant, or sorry, no, nope, your ideal gas constant. So remember that one's back. And since we're talking about energy, because the numerator of this is activation energy, we need to use the R gas constant that involves joules, which is the 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. So we're using that one. Then you have this factor. This is a, a constant. It's A. It's called the frequency factor, which we're going to see. It's going to be broken down into the collision factor and a different, another factor. But they're just basically constants. Um, and for each reaction and reactants, there, are, there is a specific constant for this frequency factor. And the activation energy is the minimum energy needed to start the reaction. And we'll see that in action in a second. Any questions on that? No? Okay. Let me write so, it down. Wait. Oh, yeah. Good? Yeah. Okay, cool. And also the Arrhenius equation will be given on the exam. So don't freak out about it either. Now, here's how generally a reaction occurs. You need energy to propel the, or to give them enough to give them, meaning the reactants, enough kinetic energy to make successful collisions at a fast enough speed in order to rearrange themselves into their products. That is how chemical reactions happen. You need energy to do that. There's some cases you don't need energy. Let's say you had hydrogen and hydrogen, just monatomic hydrogen. They spontaneously form hydrogen gas because the hydrogen gas is, so, is, is much more stable than each individual hydrogen that those um, atoms coming together will actually release energy. And you see that, remember when we went over, not we, but in Chem 1 with the molecular orbital diagrams where you put the electrons into that middle section and, that, and then the energy was lowered. That's the same approach here is that when things form stable bonds, the energy of each individual atom's electrons are then lowered. Therefore, it's more stable. But in some cases, you need to completely rearrange atoms of already stable molecules, such as this reaction of two moles of H2 uh, plus one mole of O2 makes two H2Os. H2O is very stable, but O2 and H2 are even more stable. So to force them to have a reaction and to rearrange, you need a certain amount of energy. This is called the activation energy, and it's some energy level in joules. So this activation energy, once you reach it, we call it the transition state, where it transitions from the former bonds to the potentially new bonds that it's going to make. It starts to make the new bonds. And it, we call it an activated complex, which means when the reactants have the activation energy, uh, have enough activation energy to start to form the products, they have this kind of partial bond transitional state that's in a very high energy state. And we can kind of look at this example of the isomerization of methyl isonitrile, right? But let's just take a look at what's happening first. You have this compound, CH3, single bond to an N, triple bond to a C. Everything follows the octet rule, pretty stable, right? But you can rearrange this, and you actually can use energy to rearrange this and, and form a reaction in which the C and the N switch. So in order for this to happen, the bond between the CH3 and the nitrogen needs to break, and... This, this molecule then, the C triple bond N, needs to flip. So two things need to happen. That needs to, uh, well, actually technically three things. If you want to look at a, an energetic model, is that this, this bond needs to break. The C double bond N needs to flip. And then the C single bond to the CH3 needs to form. All of this requires energy. So we can look at it in the form of our activation energy plot, and we can see this intermediate state, when it's what we call an activated complex, all that means is the reactants have reached their energy threshold to where they can start to form the products. And you can see a partial bond forming and the bond is already broken between the CH3 and the nitrogen. 
and it's in the process of rotating. I don't know. I said that weird rotating, not rotating, rotating to flip and make the CH three C bond. So that's, that's happening. And then as the reactants form the products, you see the final product has a lower energy level than the activated state, because this transition state is not stable. Transition states are never stable. If they were, then it would stop there. But the idea of all these chemical reactions is they want to exist or all these compounds, they want to exist at the lowest possible energy state and in the most energetically favorable state, which I say in my class all the time. And uh, Lauren, exactly. Or Tariq, exactly. Yeah, you're right. So, oh, Lauren, well, Lauren, a question. So it would be like John Reagan. Bond. Yeah, so the bond, so the bond breaking would normally, so normally you need energy to bond, to break bonds because you're about to force it to be broken. So that's what's happening. That's the, that's what's happening in the activation energy. So is this what happens when you add heat? Right. So heat is a form of energy. This, this is what would happen. Yeah. So heat is one form. So then when the, the bonds are going to reform, reform, energy is then released because it's coming to its stable state. And now the energy that was originally in the unstable molecules, electrons are now back in a stable position. So that energy is then released that excess. Does, it does not take, well, it generally, no. So generally it does not take energy to bond different molecules together. You, you need energy to go through reactions. So bond different molecules together, that means going through a reaction. So yeah, but in order to, so the overall pro, there's a lot going on in an overall process of a reaction. In order to break bond, this is where you get into energy of formation. So the, in, yeah, the heat would be kind of like the catalyst, but we remember we went over energy of formation. So it's the bonds broken minus the bonds formed. This was in chapter, I don't know, um, 11 or 10, something like that in, uh, in chem one. So the bonds that are broken, that energy minus the bonds formed is going to be the total energy of the formation. And usually that's negative because usually in making something new, energy is going to be released because most of the time it's going to be making something that's more stable. And you see the heat of reaction is right here. And heat of the reaction in this case is negative. Some reactions is positive, some reactions is negative. So, yeah. Okay. So another thing that we can think of that determines how fast a reaction occurs is not only the temperature. The temperature does have an effect, obviously, the Arrhenius equation, but the frequency of, the, of getting to this activation energy. So uh, we have this frequency constant, which is A, and it's the frequency factor. The more complex your molecule is, the lower the frequency factor because it'll take more time for them to reach their activated complex state, meaning to reach their transition state. So, but again, that is just a constant. So don't freak out about it. And Christina, that's exactly right. You need to have to put in work to rip apart stable molecules apart, right? Then you let them go and they click back into place, but they click back into place in a different arrangement. Yeah. So it's like you get a bunch of, get a bunch of um, magnets and they're very strong together. You use a lot of energy to break them apart and then you throw them in a box again. They're going to rearrange differently but you had to put in energy in order to break their bonds. And then when they go back into the box, they're at a more favorable, lower energy state. So now we can talk about the exponential factor in the Arrhenius equation. It's very easy to understand if we break it down. So I'm gonna get my pen out. So this e to the negative, where is it? Okay, wait, oh no. Oh, this is upside down. My pad was upside down. That would explain why I'm writing and it's going backwards. There we go. There we go. Okay. So this E to negative EA over RT, we can think about it as one over E to the EA over RT. So now what's going to happen when we increase or decrease certain things? The only, the only variables that are here are EA and T. So can someone ask, answer me, if we 
increase the activation energy. What's going to happen to the entire thing? It's going to get smaller. Good. It's going to get smaller. And think about it. Does that make sense? Because, or does that make sense? And why? Who wants to answer that? It makes sense because if you uh, increase the activation energy, then the number on the bottom is going to get a lot bigger. And so it's going to be a lot closer to zero. Good. But then what does that mean for the Arrhenius equation? Because look what that equals. K times E to the, or t no, yeah, K times A. K equals A, E to the negative EA over RT. So what does that mean with that respect? Um, does it mean that when the E, so like since that part E to the negative activation energy over RT is going to get smaller essentially, and when you multiply it by the f frequency factor, it's going to e make it even smaller because if you're multiplying it by like a decimal, it's going to get really small. So making the K factor Good. even smaller. Good. So basically, if you're increasing the activation energy, this the hump in order to go through the reaction, you are then lowering the rate constant because it will take more time and it'll take a lot more energy and more time for the molecules to reach that energy threshold in order to form their products, thus lowering the rate, the reaction rate and the rate constant. So that's why that makes sense. And then on the flip side, increasing the temperature in bold right here will increase the reaction rate. And that's because we know from basic chemistry, thinking about it logically, oh, if you increase the speed of the molecules, which is what the temperature does, then you can increase the amount of collisions. And if you increase the amount of collisions, of course, the reaction is going to go faster. But here is the reason, for the, the equation, mathematical reason for that is the Arrhenius equation. It's common sense to us now, but here's why it's common sense. Because once you're going to, you're going to decrease this, or you're going to increase this denominator, thus decreasing the quotient in the, in the exponential, which will then decrease the bottom number, which will then increase the, the total exponential factor, which will then increase the rate constant. So basically all of that means increased temperature increases reaction rate and based on the Arrhenius equation. Any questions on that? No. And then we can look at a thermal distribution where we can say that the fraction of molecules that have enough activation energy as you increase the temperature is going to be more when there's a higher temperature, which means that's proof that your reaction is going to carry on faster at a higher temperature, but it's a distribution. Remember we talked about how um, the kinetic energy of particles is a distribution. I keep saying we, but in chem one, you talked about how it's a distribution of the speed of gas molecules. The kinetic energy, they're all, the average kinetic energy is the same, but even that's a distribution. Some are slow, some are fast, some are low kinetic energy, some are high, but there's an average kinetic energy. In this case, the temperature with higher temperatures, on average, mo more molecules are going to have enough energy to pass the activation energy barrier. There's just a summarizing what I just talked about. It's more for your notes. And here's a Good question. So which statement best explains why reaction rates generally increase with increasing temperature? So we just kind of talked about this. Any ideas on which one's right? You don't sound too confident with a question mark, but yes, a is the correct answer because it, that's pretty well said that reaction rates increase with increasing temperature because as temperature increases, a greater fraction of the molecules have enough thermal energy to surmount the activation barrier. So that's perfectly said. The other ones, let's see why they're not right. Reaction rates increase with increasing temperature because as temperature increasing, the pre-exponential factor of the rate constant increases. That basically means A. No, A doesn't increase. The temperature has no bearing on A. So, I mean, the exponential factor does. And then the next one, reaction rates increase with increase in temperature because as temperature increases, molecules decompose into their constituent atoms, which then can form new bonds. Uh, no, that's not true. Gases don't decompose at higher temperatures. They just move faster. Oh, my kitty brought a zip tie over. She has to play fetch with zip tie. So I'll throw it. Now she's going to go get it.
All right. All right. Then you have Arrhenius plots. So just like the rate law, and uh, yes, that did have to do with the K equals A equation. Yeah, well, I don't want to distract you guys too much with the, with the cat cam, but maybe. I'll think of something. All right, so what you can do with the Arrhenius equation is you can integrate it. And just like you can for the rate laws, and you can integrate them, and then you can figure out a linear plot for the Arrhenius equation with respect to temperature. And this plot, again, will be given on the exam. And natural log of the rate constant equals negative EA over RT plus the natural log of the concentration. And the graph of the natural log of K versus one over T is a straight line. But remember for first order rate laws, the natural log of the concentration over time is a straight line. This is completely different. This is natural log of K over one over T. And this is not just for first order, for, this is for all of them. So, because uh, first order, second order, that relates to the reactant concentration. Here, we're assuming the reactant concentration is static. It's not going anywhere. And we're supposed to see how fast if you heard, yeah, we heard the kitty. Why? She's grumpy. Uh, okay. And then you can also have this two point form of the Arrhenius equation. Again, will be given. And you could, you might see in a, a question with like plug and chug. Um, so questions, you use this when you're relating temperature. So last class, all of the equations we talked about last class had to do with the change in reactant concentration with respect to rate to reaction rate. Now we're talking about the temperature, how the, the temperature is a second factor that relates to the reaction rate. We didn't talk about temperature at all. Now we're talking about temperature and there's equations that govern that. So here's an example of what, what kind of questions we would see. So consider the reaction between nitrogen dioxide and carbon monoxide. The rate constant at 701 is measured at that. And at 895, it's measured at, at that. Find the activation energy for the reaction in kilojoules per mole. So what you can do is you have two temperatures at point A and point B. You have two rate constants at point A and point B. You have R. So you can plug all of those values in. And then you can solve for activation energy. That's, that's a pretty easy example, but that's something that you can possibly get. And another thing is, what order is this rate law? That's another question they could ask, relating it back to last class. What order is the rate law and how would you be able to tell? The units, good, Andy, good, the units. So the units of the rate constant, remember they're different for each, each rate law for zero, first, and second order. So if in case you forgot, we'll go back. Oh, second order. Ronit got it. So second order. And we can just see the units. So units of K, zero order is a molar per second. First order is just per second. And second order is per molar per second. So that's what we have here. We have per molar per second, which means it's second order. And then we can solve that. And once we do all of the algebra, you get EA equals 1.45 times 10 to the fifth joules per mole. You could divide that by a thousand to get the kilojoules per mole. And those are kind of some questions you would get a simple plug and chug uh, kind of solving for your unknown variable. Any questions on that? All right, conceptual question. So reaction A and reaction B have identical frequency factors. Remember the frequency factor is A in the K equals A E to the negative EA over RT. However, reaction B has a higher activation energy. Which reaction has a greater rate constant at room temperature? So temperatures are held constant. So reaction B has higher activation energy, but everything else is the same. Which one is going to go faster? Would it be reaction A? Because since we have the higher activation energy and it's like the one over E to the activation, E to the EA over RT. It's like the same thing. So since that's going to be smaller, it's automatically going to make everything else smaller. So reaction A would have the greater rate constant because Perfect. it has a lower activation energy. Good. Hit the nail on the head. Good. So that's the rationale with the Arrhenius equation. And um, yeah, so great, great job. Yeah. I mean, the way I think about it, I try to simplify things. So higher activation energy, 
means tougher for the reaction to continue, meaning it's going to have a lower rate constant than another reaction that has a lower activation energy. But good job. Okay, so uh, now we can talk about collision theory. Now, collision theory basically means that molecules collide all the time, right? Especially when you have increasing temperatures, you have more collisions. But there's a difference between a collision and an effective collision. A, an effective collision suggests that there is some orientation of the molecules that is more prone to forming the product or form it or more prone to committing to a chemical reaction. And, and this is, this has been proven true. I mean, if you have, and this has been proven true, especially, I see this, especially in biology where you have large macromolecules like proteins and enzymes and sugars and things like that, lipids that will only react with each other in specific orientations. For atoms, we don't usually think about this in atoms and molecules because they're so small in comparison to macromolecules that these collisions are often insignificant. But there are number, numbers to govern their effective collisions. And sometimes it, is, it, do, it does become significant when you're comparing different reactions. So here's a little GIF showing what I mean by effective collisions, that there's a specific orientation that these molecules are looking for in order to into or, in order to form their activated complex and thus form their product. So um, you can think about it. And there's billions of these happening per second. So it's about time. It would, even in a fast reaction, there's probably a couple of hundred um, unsuccessful collisions before there's one successful one. But that happens in milliseconds, nanoseconds even because there's so many molecules. So then we can break down the Arrhenius or what we call the pre-exponential factor. So you have, we talked about the exponential factor already, E to the negative EA over RT, but A, which is the frequency factor, can be broken down into, oh, to answer your question, it's GIF, not GIF, it's GIF. GIF is the peanut butter. So. Mm -hmm. Incorrect. Continue. Oh, okay. All right. I see how it is. No extra credit for you. <laughs> I'm kidding. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll see about this. I mean, if you can provide evidence that it's not GIF, that I will gladly look at it. So keep that in mind. You might get extra credit for good evidence if you can change my mind. All right. Anyway. So um, you, have, you can break down A, which is the frequency factor, into P times Z. So P is the orientation factor, and Z is the collision frequency. And it, that's, those, those are, again, what we're doing, it's, we're breaking down one constant into two other constants. So don't freak out about this. You're not going to have to, if you're going to have to solve for one of them, you'll have all the other values. So don't go crazy over it. But what the derivative of a where you get a from it's from the orientation factor and the orientation factor varies for different molecules and so does the collision frequency so again don't go crazy on it but you can have ineffective collisions and you can have effective collisions and again the molecules must align in a specific orientation for the reaction to occur that's the main driving point here we call effective collisions and the collision frequency is a number of collisions that happen per second and again, it's a constant usually for certain reactions. And then the orientation factor, it's usually a frequency. It's usually like a percentage kind of um, how many, how many what percent of the molecules have the, or what is the percent, what's the percent chance of the molecules hitting at the right frequency or hitting at the right uh, orientation? That's what the orientation factor represents in general. But again, they're constants, so don't freak out over them. So think about this, Sebastian. I like your I like your uh, argument. Graphical interchange format, not giraffical. So graphic GIF, not giraffic. That's where I got it from. So I mean, yep, Sebastian. I can tell he's going to get an A in this class. <laughs> All right, um, we should get back into chemistry. 
All right, now this question, think about it. Don't think about equations. Think about it from a logical point of view. Which reaction do you expect to have the smallest orientation factor? So which one, so the orientation factor, what makes it small, what makes it big? And we should go back to it. So generally, this is a very important, uh, this, is probably, this is probably the most important bullet. Generally, the more complex reactant molecules, the smaller the value of P. So orientation factor, if it's one, that means it, they're 100% of the time, they're gonna be in the correct orientation. That's what that means. If it's very close to one, there's a smaller chance of it, of chance of the molecules being in the correct orientation. So which one of these, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, you guys are getting into it on the, but I got to look at, wait a minute. This might be wrong. Hold on. The smaller the value of P. That's right. This is right. So the question is asking for which one you have the smallest. Oh, that makes sense. Wait, no, no. The answer should be C, but they have A. This book, oh my God, I hate this. These, these slides are like wrong on, like on multiple of these questions. I didn't even catch this one. It messes up my lesson. So the answer should be C, because he's asking for the smallest. Yeah, that's weird. Okay. I didn't even see that in the... What, whatever. All right. I hate this. Oh, <laughs> I got to check, I got to check the slides more thoroughly. I go over like, I go over each slideshow for like an hour beforehand to modify it, but I got, I got to actually do them more specifically. Okay. That's it. Yes. Can you kind of explain why it's C? Of course I will. Of course. I'm going to go over it right now. So the question is asking for which reaction do you expect to have the smallest orientation factor? Small orientation factor means the percent chance of them colliding in the correct orientation is lower, meaning they're more complex. If you have two HCl molecules, there's more going on there and there's more differences. Let's say they can only arrange, let's say they can only collide successfully when they have HCl bumping against HCl like this. So I'm gonna draw a picture. All right, so let's say these can only bump correctly like this, right? They have to be in this arrangement. The percent out of all the arrangements that these can be spun into, the percent of this arrangement happening is 0 0.1 or 10%. Let's just say that. For this one, the, for B, you have H2 and I2. Let's say this again, is the correct orientation that they can hit into, that they could react. They can go into different orientations, but if you notice, if you flip both of them, they're completely symmetrical, right? So if you flip them, that's another orientation. So that means that we can say that these are twice as likely to hit in the correct orientation than C is. So we can say its frequency factor is 0.2, for yep. example. But for HCl, when they both flip over, isn't it still technically the same thing? As right, well? when they both flip over. But in this case, if one of these flip over, it's still the same thing. Because they're symmetrical. Uh, yeah, okay. Right. And then for A, it's even more simple. You just have singular spherical atoms. So no matter what arrangement they have, no matter what the collision is going to be, it's going to, it's going to form a product. Therefore, their frequency factor is probably 1.0. So the smallest frequency factor means the more complex or least likely to hit in the specific orientation in order to create a product. So the answer would be C. Okay. I think I feel like you guys know that better because the book made a mistake and I had to go through more trouble to explain it. So that's good. Uh, any questions on that? 
All right. Okay. So now we're going to switch gears a little bit. We're almost done. This is probably go another 20 minutes or so. Uh, is that how I could? Th yeah, but basically my explanation is how you can think of it and how you should think about it. As the, the frequency factor, it's not really a percent, but it's, and Christina, it's Brian, not brain. <laughs> All right. You guys are good. You guys are funny. Okay. So um, it's not really a percent. The frequency factor is not really a percent, but you can think of it like a percent because sometimes you can have it greater than one, but that's because there's, it's more likely to occur than random hitting into each other because there's actually an attraction force, such as an electron transfer, making an ionic bond. In that case, it would be more than one. But if it was just two innate mo or inert molecules, then it would be about one that are spherical, I mean. Okay. Anyway, then we can talk about reaction mechanisms. So we're going to kind of change gears, switch gears a little bit. We're not going to talk about temperature or collisions anymore. We're actually going to go back a little bit to the reactant concentration and the rate law. And what we're going to talk about is that each overall reaction can be broken down into reaction steps. And it's actually a mechanism. And you've seen these mechanisms before. You've seen them in chapter seven, where we talked about Hess's law. Remember how there was two or three reactions where you had to manipulate, flip over in order to cancel out all of the intermediates, the things that were not in the overall reaction. We're going to be learning about those specific equations today about this reaction mechanism. And oh no, but Hess's law is fun. This is gonna be fun too. So here's an example. You've seen these before. Hopefully you don't get PTSD from your Hess's law, but you have an overall reaction and then it can be broken down into its mechanism. And you can see that this mechanism, if you cancel out what's in common on the left and the right side, the HI and that's it, that's it. And then you add them up. And then you have H2 plus 2ICL equals 2HCL plus I2. Whatever does not uh, form in the uh, overall reaction, whatever is not uh, used in the overall reaction is what we call an intermediate. So HI is an intermediate. Usually when it's the product of one reaction and the reactant in the next reaction, it's then the intermediate. So what we can do is we can break down these mechanisms into elementary steps. They are elementary. There's two elementary steps here. And they cannot be broken down to simpler reactions. But what are these, why are these molecular, or why are these elementary steps important? So what are we going to use this for? Where am I going with this? So we talked about intermediates already, right? The, the, the products from the first reaction that are used for the reactants in the second one, it's kind of like a catalyst, right? And, and they, um, they are, well, they're, it's kind of like a catalyst, but not really because they are consumed because they're not in the product anymore, but they do kind of intermediate. It's like an intermediate. It, we call it the intermediate because it's not really a, a catalyst. Yeah, exactly. Like enthalpy. Um, I'll post these slides, the ones with my annotations on it. Okay. But what we can tell from these, these elementary steps is we can tell their molecularity. This is a new word, molecularity. And it's very simple, but it kind of, it kind of, we might get confused if we're talking about last week's stuff and this week's stuff. But what we can say is in the context, very important, in the context of a reaction mechanism that has its elementary steps, we can say, we can categorize these steps as unimolecular, bimolecular, or termolecular. What that means is unimolecular, a step that involves one particle as a reactant. Bimolecular, a step that involves two particles as a reactant. Termolecular, steps that involve three particles as reactants. So we can kind of categorize these steps. Now, we can go back to this mechanism of the reaction we saw, and both of these elementary steps are bimolecular, meaning you have two molecules that are adding up to make other thing, other products. 
So it's bimolecular. So it involves two particles, all it means. So here's an example. We have the same example. We have two bimoleculars. And yes, I'm going to post them with the written notes on them. I don't think I did that last week, but I'll do that this week. I have them with the written notes, I think. I'll definitely post them this week. Okay. So here we have two bimolecular steps. And with the bimolecular steps, or with knowing the molecularity of the steps, we can write the rate law for them. This is different than what we learned. So what we learned so far is that if we have a reaction, in order to find the rate law for that reaction, we must have experimental data. We must have times, concentrations, uh, rates of reaction, K values. We must have a lot more numbers in order to accurately write the rate law. But in this case, under the scope of molecularity, and reaction intermediates and reaction mechanisms, we don't need that because they're only they're broken down from an overall reaction. But the overall reaction itself does need experimental data in order to figure its rate law. But using its intermediates or using its using its elementary steps, we can kind of figure out the rate law for it. And here's how. And here is the rate laws for the elementary steps that you'll have to use to categorize a list of elementary steps that are part of a reaction. And it's very easy. So if you have one product equal or one reactant equals products, the molecularity is one and the rate law is rate equals Ka for that, for that elementary reaction, not the total reaction, just the elementary step. If you have A plus A, it's rate equals k a squared a plus b rate equals k a times b three a's rate equals k a cubed two a's and a b rate equals a rate equals k a squared times b and then one of each of a b and c a times b times c so you're basically the number of particles in the reactants is going to be your exponent Oh, and how can you tell if something's A or B, how many different types of molecules there are. So if you have a reaction that is, so this is going to be A, this is going to be B, H2 and ICL. But if you had two ICL yields products, then here you would have rate equals K ICL squared. feel like you're learning poker hands. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. So um, these are different combinations you can have. Here's an e example. So what would be the rate law for this elementary step? CL plus CO equals CLCL. What do you think? And it's always the reactants that are in it. And yeah, D is the answer. Good. So the book got that one right at least. So it's going to be your two reactants is two particles, one and two. And they're going to be K times their concentrations. So it is a bimolecular interaction, bimolecular elementary step. So what is, why are we doing this? That's a good question we could ask ourselves. The reason why we're doing this is because in order to figure out the rate law for a complete overall reaction like this one, before we learned about this right now, we would need information. We would need technical data or measurements on the time we would know we would need to know what order it is or we would, we, didn't, we would need to know information that would tell us what order it is in order to use our integrated rate law our half-life and things like that to find the rate law but another way to find that rate law is to know the rate law of its elementary steps and deduce it from that information so that's what we're doing. And the way to do this is by using the rate determining step. The slowest, this is important. So the slowest step in a reaction mechanism 
is the rate determining step. Basically meaning the reaction is as fast as the slowest part of it. You're as fast as the weakest link in a race. And that's the R, they call it RDS, rate determining step. It's the slowest one and it has the largest activation energy, which makes sense. So the rate law of this step determines the overall rate law. So the reaction is limited to being as fast as the slowest step. And here's an example of that. So if we have this mechanism that has two reactions in it, one of them is slow, one of them is fast. This one has a higher activation energy, EA1, therefore it is slower and it is the rate determining step. Whereas EA2 has it's lower, lower activation energy and um, it's just another a second non-rate determining step. So for example, if you have one reaction, K observed or rate observed equals K times NO squared, meaning it's second order with respect to NO and it doesn't depend on CO at all. The only way to figure that out besides using this information would be to um, have experimental data. Uh, we see a question here in one second. So will this be the case with the highest activation? Oh, so um, the, the highest activation energy could not be the first step. Sometimes it's not. So it could be second or third step. It doesn't matter. Wait, I have a question. How yes. do we know which reaction is fast and which one's slow? Or like, they'll, are we going to oh, be given good. that? Yeah, they'll tell you. So yeah, they'll, they'll, tell, they'll give you that information. Okay, thank you. Okay, so but what we're going to need to do with these is we're going to need to do some algebra. And here's the kind of questions, and you're still thinking, all right, what kind of questions are they going to ask about this? So here's what they're going to ask. They're going to ask you to validate a mechanism. Ooh, that seems tough, right? Let's just do an example. Okay, I don't know why this is blue in the background, but let's just look at the example. All right. Ozone naturally decomposes to oxygen to form this reaction. The experimentally observed rate law for this reaction is this. Rate equals K times O three squared times O2 to the minus one. Okay, that's a weird rate law, right? Because we're not used to seeing a product in there with a, to the negative one. Now it's gonna get weird. Now we're gonna be like, all right, how do we prove that? Suppose that this is the proposed mechanism. You have O3 to make O2 plus O, and that's a reversible reaction. You're giving two different rate constants. And then, well, we're gonna do this together. And then you're given a slow one, which is O3 plus O equals two O2, and that's not reversible. So you're given a fast and a slow. And this is the rate. So what are we gonna do? So we're going to try to validate. So determine the, the question is show that the proposed mechanism is consistent with the experimental observed law. All right, we can do that. Yeah. Um, so the reason why O2 is raised to the power of negative one is because it's a product, but we'll talk about it more specifically. Now here's how to figure out from looking at different parts of a reaction mechanism, what the rate law is. So what the molecularity is. So the experimentally observed rate law is rate equals K times O3 squared times O2 to the minus one. We want to prove this based on the information for the fast part and the slow part of the reaction. So question, which reaction, the fast one or the slow one, will dictate the speed of the overall reaction? The slow one. The slow one. Good. So we can write this bimolecular interaction, this bimolecular rate law for the slow one. And that is going to be as rate equals the concentration of O3, or sorry, K. K times the concentration, K2 actually. K2 times the concentration of O3 times the concentration of O. That's it. Equals, and that's the rate. So this is going to be 
So basically what we're doing is we're trying to prove that, remember, the rate of the slowest step is the same rate as the overall reaction. We're trying to prove, we're basically doing like an algebra proof. We're trying to prove that this equation equals this equation. Now, before we do that, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. If you have any questions, let me know. Oh, yeah. Ed, you cut out for me for a minute. Sorry. Oh, it's okay. Um, do you need me to re-say anything? Uh, just, to, I lost you for the last 20 seconds. Oh, okay. So the most important thing I said is now we're going to prove, we're just kind of doing like an algebraic proof on how this rate law, which is the rate of the slowest reaction, which again, the rate of the slowest reaction is the rate of the overall reaction. We're going to see how this is equal to the rate law that's given. That's what we're trying to do. So, so show that the proposed mechanism is consistent with the experimentally observed rate law. Okay. So how do we do that? We want to solve for things. So we have O3, we have O here, we have O3 and O2. So we can solve for things and we have equations from the fast reaction. We can have two rate laws or two rate equations from the fast reaction, one going forward and one going back. So the one going forward would be the rate equals K1 times O3. And the one going backwards would be rate equals K negative one times O2 times O. Now the, the way I did that was I took the reactants and, and I went by the elementary steps. So this chart up here, if you have A plus B, it's just A times B. If you have a squared, it's or two A, then it's A squared. So I use that kind of, I, I use the elementary step template to the rate law. Like this. So now what we want to do is we want to prove that this left equation equals the right one. Now, what we can do, let's see. We can see how We can solve for things. And we can, what we can do is we can say that, all right, these two rates for the fast equation are equal to each other. They're just the opposite. One's going backwards, one's going forwards, but their magnitude is equal to each other. So we can do that. We can write that K1 times O3 is equal to K minus one times O2 times O. And then what we can do is we can solve for really anything. We can solve for O3, we can solve for O2, but let's solve for O. Because what we're trying to do is look, we're trying to solve, we're trying to make this equation look the same as this one. This equation has is in terms of O3 and O2. This equation is just in terms of O3 and O. So if we would make O in terms of O2 and O3, that might give us our answer. So let's do that. We're gonna solve for O. We divide by K to the minus one or K minus one and we divide by O2. So what we end up with is K one times O three divided by K to the minus one divided by O two equals O. And now this can get plugged into here. And then we can end up with this equation and all the K's, there's different K's, there's three K's here. There's K two, K one and K negative one they can all condense into an overall rate constant because they're all, they're all constants, but I know there's questions on that. So do you want me to go over it again or do a different one? We're gonna do another one, but do you want me to go over it again or have any questions? Will we ever have to prove the rate in a test or homework assignment, or is this just conceptual? So it's on the homework in, in different forms. Okay, if you want me to go over it again, I'm gonna go over it again on a different page. But in terms of on the test, they will ask you questions about it, but in different ways. So it, it's something that you need to know, but they'll ask about it in different ways. I'll say that. So be familiar with it. Oh, why is this blue? I hate that. Just 
So is another way that we can do it, can we solve for like K1 or K2? Or yes. can you only so solve there, for like- There are different ways to do it, but I recommend K, you can't really solve for the Ks because each K is different in the reactions. So if you saw the different reactions, there's K1 going forwards, there's K negative one going backwards, and then there's K2, which is completely different. They're different numbers. Where is it? Right here. So they're different numbers. So it's not good to solve for that. It's usually good to solve for the concentrations of each of the reactants. So that's the, that's the way to go. You don't usually want to solve for K. Okay, but regardless, we'll do this one again because there is some questions on it. All right. All right, hopefully you can see that. There we go. So we're trying to validate this big rate law with this information. All right. Now, the information that we can figure out from looking at these different elementary steps is that the rate going forward of reaction fast is K1 times the concentration of O3. The rate going backwards equals K minus one times the reaction concentration of O2 times O. That's for the fast. But the fast, again, does not dictate the speed of the overall. The slow does. So we're saying this slow reaction is our template for making it look like our overall. So our template would be rate equals K2 times O3 times O. And since I picked, the reason why I picked O to, um, to solve for is because the rate law that we're trying to prove is in terms of O3 and O2. This rate law of the slow is in terms of O3 and O. So we need O to be in terms of O2 and O3. So that's what we can do. These rates, okay, I'll stop there. Is, is there any questions on that part, on the logic there? Okay. The next step that maybe some of you got confused on is that since this equilibrium reaction is exactly that, at equilibrium, or it's an, it's an equilibrium reaction in general, we can say that the reaction rate going forward is the same as the reaction rate going back. So we can say that this reaction rate equals this reaction rate. So K1 times O3 equals K minus one times O2 times O. And now, like we said, we wanna solve for O in order to get rid of this O value to make it look more like our overall rate. So we can divide by K to the minus one times O2. And we end up with K1 times O3 over K minus one times O2 equals O. Any questions on that? Can you go over why you canceled out, well, how you canceled out the O2 part? Oh, because I just divided by both sides. I'm just solving. I'm solving for O. So you divide by both sides, K1. So you divide the right side and the left side by K to the minus one over. Or, oh, I see. I see. All yeah, right. I, I'm solving. Right. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. Good question. Good question. Um, any other questions on this part so far? No? All right. So the last step was I'm going to plug in this O into our slow reaction rate law. So we end up with rate equals K2 times O3 times, instead of O, it's K1 times another O3 divided by K minus one times O2. And this can be simplified. Now, mul multiple rate constants like this you can simplify it into one constant. So it's some K, right? It's about multiplying and dividing a bunch of constants. You can make it another constant. Times O3 squared times O2 
to the negative one since that's in the denominator. And then look at that. The rate law for your slow reaction now looks identical to the rate law of the overall reaction. And that's exactly what we want to prove. Okay, good, good. Hopefully that made more sense. Any other questions about it? If it didn't, because it is, it is tough, so. No, all right. All right one second. That one's really hot for no reason. I don't know why. Throw the charger. Okay. All right. Moving on. Last thing we're going to learn about today is catalysts. So some of you mentioned catalysts already. Now, a catalyst is something that can affect the rate of the reaction. In other words, lower or decrease the activation energy without being consumed. That's the key word, without being consumed. So these kind of reaction intermediates, the things that get canceled out and crossed out like this, are not catalysts. They help the reaction, but they are consumed in the end. Because look, in the product, they're not there anymore. So they're gone. And also, here's another example for that rate law. Should we do another, want to do another example for, the, um, for that the kind of question we just did? I'll do it anyway, whatever. Um, so yeah, I figured, you, yeah, OK. Uh, well, we'll get through this one. And there's actually a mis there's another mistake here. I caught this mistake. Is that as we can do? We'll we'll put that over there. We'll, we'll delete that honestly. All right. So in this one, we have three elementary steps. We have a fast one, a slow one, and a fast one. And now we have our observed rate. So we're trying to do the same thing. We're trying to show that the slow rate equals the rate observed. And you look at the differences. K2, K, H2, H2, N2O2, NO squared. So we're trying to, the game plan is to get N2O2 in terms of NO. That's the game plan. So what do we have to do? We have, to, we have three equations to deal with here. The first one, is that for step one, the rate forward equals the rate backwards. So the rate K1 times NO squared, since this is a two, it would go to the squared like that. K1 times NO squared equals the backwards reaction is K minus one times just N2O2. So we did that already. We, we kind of did that for the previous one. Then what we can do, and we don't even need to use the other ones, I don't think. What we can do, or maybe we do, let's see. I don't think we do actually. Yeah. yeah. So what we can do is solve for exactly what we're looking for. Oh, okay. I'll, well, I mean, I'm not going to restart. I'll, I'll, I'll continue it right now. Um, so here we have both of the rates from this fast reaction going forward and going backwards equal to each other. Then we can do what we just said is we're going to solve for N2O2 in terms of NO. We want the slow rate to look exactly like the rate observed. And we can do that. So we want N2O2 equals K1 divided by K negative one times NO squared. We can plug this in to our slow rate right there. And we get rate equals K2 times H2 times K1 over K minus one times NO squared. The Ks would cancel out to make one big K and we end up with K times H2 times NO squared like that. Equals rate. Okay, does that make a sense? Hopefully, okay. All right, so we'll talk about catalysts for a little bit. So catalysts, again, they are not consumed. So they might be reacted with, but then they end up being not consumed in the overall reaction. So um, 
they might like for we'll talk about enzymes in a bit. I can talk about enzymes all day, but so for example, reactions without catalysts are very slow, but with a catalyst, they're very fast, obviously. So they lower the activation energy. That's what they do. So if you have a catalyst in there, it lowers the activation energy. There are a ton of different types of catalysts and you don't need to be, don't go crazy in knowing the different types and everything, but there are heterogeneous catalysts, which are the same phase as the particle. And then there are homogeneous catalysts, which are a different phase, such as sometimes in liquid and aqueous solutions, if you need a catalyst, sometimes you use um, solid metal, some platinum metal. That's a good catalyst. And even in gas reactions, sometimes you can use that. Um, but sometimes it just helps the reactant molecules to find each other and form that more stable activated complex. So here's a catalytic converter. It uses a catalyst. This is a metal catalyst. In order to, and even though you're dealing with gases. So that's an example of a homogeneous catalyst. And there's a bunch of different types. Let's talk about um, enzymes this is my favorite. So enzymes are the, one of the most efficient catalysts in, in biology. So basically the way it works is an enzyme is a big protein, it's a macromolecule, and it has different sites on it, right? And, they, and these sites, we can call one of them, the main one is the active site, which can bind a substrate. And a substrate is just like a, a key, right? The enzyme is a lock. And maybe for those of you who took biology, you've heard of the lock and key model. So an enzyme can look like that. And then your, your substrate can look like, let's say you have two substrates, right? Substrate can look like this, where this can go directly in there. Another substrate would look like, look like that. And it'll go directly in there. They bind very well. This enzyme is floating around and it will bring, it will actually attract these two particles, particle number one and particle number two to come in close proximity. And once that happens, you end up with a one, two like that, which is the product. So the enzyme plus the substrates equal the enzyme substrate complex, which then equals the product plus the enzyme. Because look what happens is once the substrate, the substrates bind to the enzyme, they, the enzyme does its thing, makes them react. And then the product is released. The enzyme is still there. The enzyme is there to do another reaction if other reactants are nearby. So it is never consumed in the reaction. The substrates don't change the activity of the enzyme. So here's kind of what it looks like. You have a substrate. In this case, it's a cleavage, meaning um, it, it breaks apart, is cleaved. So here's a substrate, goes in perfectly to the active site. These are very specific. Enzymes are incredibly specific. If you're off by a couple of atoms, it won't bind. It will bind a hundredfold less potently if you're off by a couple of carbons. So it's very specific. And once the substrate binds, it forms products, the products are released. This enzyme active site will then be open to accept other substrates in the environment. So Here's it's the, like a puzzle piece? It's basically yep, like a puzzle piece. It's, it's very specific. And um, there's different ways you can change the puzzle piece and make it not work as well. So that's one part of drug discovery that I, research I'm involved in is we, are, we deal with enzymes and some enzymes are, um, are cause cancer. They're oncogene enzymes. And what we try to do is dysregulate this puzzle piece, this kind of key. It does look like a puzzle piece. We can kind of dysregulate this to change the shape of it. Once we change the shape of it, to make it like that, let's say, what's not gonna bind? The substrate is not gonna be able to bind as well if it's a different shape. That lowers the affinity and lowers the activity of the enzyme. But if the enzyme caused cancer, we want to do that. We want to lower the activity of it. So that's something that I work on in my research to develop drugs to actually either competitively inhibit, which we call meaning it actually comes in there and blocks the substrate from binding or can allosterically inhibit, meaning it can bind on the other side of the enzyme, but that will like group this 
lobe of the enzyme down, changing the shape of this site, making the substrate not bind as well, which is an easier thing to do because these are formed after billions of years of evolution and they are extremely specific to their substrate. To, to make something in a lab that is competitive with something that's been engineered by mother nature for billions of years is very difficult. So there's a little insight into things that I do. It is very interesting. Thank you, Brian.